Mr. Valley Brown, Ryan Lamb, Namvula Omira, did I get it? Yes, you sure did. All right, and Dean Preston for attending tonight's forum, and thanks to all of you also. We will start off with one minute opening statements in alphabetical order. Ms. Brown, you yes, may that's begin. Me. Mm -hmm. Okay, is this on? Okay. Hi, I'm Valley Brown, and I've had the privilege of being your District 5 supervisor now for this last year. For over 25 years, I've been your neighbor and I've been an activist. I've helped help uh, make sure we keep a neighborhood school open in the violence in this district and also work to make vibrant and uh, safe neighborhoods. I've been, um, I've been sole endorsed by the San Francisco Democratic Party, San Francisco Firefighters, SEIU Local 1021, Planned Parenthood, League of Conservative Voters, and many other uh, committees, and uh, San Francisco Political Committee too, and also state and local elected leaders. And since I've been in office, I have passed over 29 pieces of legislation. I fought to keep, um, uh, but we have so much more to do. We have to fix Muni, we have to uh, build more affordable housing, and we also have to uh, solve the homeless crisis. So thank you, UCSF and the League of Women Voters for having us tonight. Mr. Lamb. Hello, hello. Hi, my name is Ryan Lamb. I'm running for District 5 Supervisor. A little bit about me is I immigrated to here in 2003. Uh, my professional history includes I was a former political journalist a high school tutor, and also a, a former businessman. And the reason I'm running today is for three points that I'm really, really passionate about. And that's maintaining the cleanliness and safety of District 5, having, fixing our affordability crisis, and I promise a decrease in homelessness, and fighting for local businesses to build a strong economy where the American dream is a, is a reality, and it's true. So. That's me, Ryan Lamb. Thank you very much, Mr. Lamb. Ms. O'Mara. Hello. Hi, everyone. My name is Namvula O'Mara. I'm going to be really, try to be really quick. Uh, 60 seconds isn't really long to introduce yourself, but uh, ready, set. Um, so, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Namvula O'Mara. I am a mother of three children whom I have raised and co parented here in San Francisco. Matter of fact, um, this was my first neighborhood, the Inner Sunset. I lived here for eight years, and I still know most of my neighbors as to their children, and I've actually run into some of them. Our children went to the same daycares together at Laurel Village, so I have a long history in this neighborhood. Um, to be very quick, uh, the reason why I'm running is because all my children are millennials. They range in age from 11, 19, and 23. The oldest being Savannah, who just graduated in computer science and pre-law. The reason I'm running is because when our children graduate or come out of school, they can't afford to pay the rent here. And it's just not my children who are affected. Any child of college age, 18 years old, or millennial cannot. So that's the main reason I'm running. Priorities, prioritize housing, expand housing, improve the performance index in public schools. That's just some of the matters. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Preston. <laughs> Hey everyone, I'm Dean Preston. I'm running for supervisor because the status quo in San Francisco is just not working. Uh, we're the least affordable city in the entire country with staggering inequality and we are absolutely on the wrong track. District 5 deserves an independent leader with a track record of accomplishments who's ready to take on the root causes of our problems. I've never been a city hall insider. I'm a civil rights and tenant rights attorney. I founded California's only statewide tenant rights group, which led the fight to save rent control when it was under attack. I'm a democratic socialist who believes everyone deserves affordable housing, health care, fair wages, and equal access to power. I have been on the front lines fighting in District 5 for the last 20 years, and my campaign is about taking bold steps, a Green New Deal for San Francisco, free public transit, a public bank to reinvest in our communities, and social housing to reverse displacement. 
We cannot afford the status quo. We need to rethink what's possible in thank, our city. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, now we're gonna begin with the questions that were asked from you, the audience. And I think this first question will be very good in giving us an idea of, of how you see or how you wish to approach um, the position of supervisor for District 5. So could you tell us what specifically will you do to engage with District 5 residents when it comes to quality of life issues like development, public transportation, homelessness, and public space? And the first, um, Ms. Brown, you get this well, question. Yeah, I've actually done a lot in a year. I've passed 29 pieces of legislation, housing, uh, I actually uh, legislated housing on Divisadero with 20% affordable, and at the time that was the highest inclusionary housing in this city. I've also um, uh, did the, um, uh, I'm really the only candidate that's worked in affordable housing, so I identified uh, public and uh, private sites so we can build 100% affordable. I also put $40 million with my colleague, Supervisor Fewer, to buy buildings that people were being Ellis Act and evicted. We actually bought a building on Schrader, all seven units, uh, everybody was saved. Um, so these are some of the things I've been doing. I've also been working on homeless. I, I legislated the first navigation center for vehicles because we know that's our biggest uh, increase in homeless. I actually today cut a ribbon at St. Mark's Church to make it actually, um, it's a resting place for homeless to go in the daytime. So there's many things that I could do, but the minute is, or tell you about, but the minute is too short. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Lamb? One thing I take pride in is, is transparency in my campaign. With a click on my website, you can access my, my team's number, my email, um, all my policies. And when it comes to affordability, homelessness, I, me personally, I was formerly homeless in 2017, and I think I'm the only candidate who has a well-rounded knowledge of our homelessness crisis has gone up for, what is it, eight years straight. And in my campaign, I promise a decrease in homelessness. Um, when it comes to affordable housing, I want to build 1,000 uh, 1, plus units in District 5. And uh, yeah. OK, thank you very much. Ms. O'Meara? Uh, <clears throat> if you could just go over the question again, I wanted to make sure I understood every point. Um, OK, yeah, what this. specifically will you do to engage with District 5 residents when it comes to quality of life issues like development, public transportation, homelessness, and public space? OK, perfect. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to make it very clear that I um, I'm in uh, disagreement with Ryan when he says he knows homelessness from uh, first, um, first, exp first hand experience. Um, I didn't share this as part of my bio, but it's in the Department of Elections bio that I've um, let everybody um, know is that I did actually experience homelessness. And that was after living, uh, I'd lived in the inner sunset a few blocks down from here for about eight years. Um, I, experienced, I experienced homelessness for a year with three young children, by the way, and I was actually doing my master's at the same time with a newborn baby. So I'm very, very familiar with that. Not only that, I'd also worked as a case manager in the city in dual diagnosis programs. So how to tackle the problem of homelessness? Well, expand housing for one, have better um, renters' rights, create better re re renters' rights, such as the work that Dean just worked on with Prop C. Um, you can have better quality of life if you restrict um, landlords, especially corporate landlords, in terms of Thank price you. gouging. Sorry, okay. Okay, Thank, Thank you very much. Sure. Mr. Preston? Thank you. Well, in terms of engaging neighbors, we'll continue doing what we've been doing. Our campaign has knocked on thousands of doors, talked to many of you about the issues that matter most in the district. And, and you know what we're hearing is that people are fed up with a city that is, uh, has a $12 billion budget and cannot seem to meet the basic needs of what folks in this district want. Affordable housing, to be able to get on a bus without being so crowded that you can't get on, um, and to have basic uh, quality of life. The other thing that we hear 
Um, and it's really important is people in this city understand that most of these problems are caused because someone's getting rich off of these problems. We have dysfunctional public transit in part uh, because of private companies that are privatizing our public transportation system. We have unaffordable housing because a small handful of corporate investors are making money by making housing unfor unaffordable uh, to the folks in this room, the people who live in the district. So we will continue to take those folks on to make this a livable city. Thank you very much. I'm sorry if I'm looking kind of befuddled up here, it's because this thing keeps going down and I don't know exactly why. Okay, <laughs> so, but I'm gonna continue. Okay, we'll come up to question two for Mr. Lamb. Um, and I believe um, that we should stay on the issue of housing in District 5. Do you believe, do you believe, and if you do believe, how, what ideas do you have for speeding up the permitting process for creating more housing in our district. Do you? Okay. Um, one thing about building housing is I think it should be based on supply and demand. Um, we have candidates on the stage that um, just want to build as much public housing and uh, affordable housing as we possibly can, and some people actually suffer from that. I think it's more about planning and taking the time to plan to make sure that this affordable housing is going to be good for District 5. I mean, if you look at the th 350 Octavia building project, I know Valley hasn't uh, reached out to them, but they, they suffer because we have to build so much, we have to build more affordable housing right in front of their front, lawn, front yard by cutting the trees and building more units. So I think it's more about planning and making sure that we have enough affordable housing based on supply and demand in District 5. Thank you very much. Ms. O'Meara? Yeah. Well, I think the uh, demand of housing in San Francisco far exceeds uh, the supply. Uh, there's a definite a huge chasm um, in our um, inability to supply what's already needed. And hence again, I want to reinforce that our young people, the millennials between ages 18 to 25, are the ones most affected by it. Um, and that's important to consider, and that's not to uh, disclude uh, seniors or people who've just been renting San Francisco a long time. So mm. what my suggestions are, uh, prioritize housing and expand it, reintroduce, uh, reintroduce certificates of housing for formerly marginalized com communities like uh, African Americans and brown, in the Fillmore District, or Bayview, Hunters Point, um, really protect uh, renters and tenants' right. We'll go a long way by repealing um, uh, Costa Hawkins, for instance. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Preston. How would you speed up the permitting process? Would you speed up the permitting process for housing, and hopefully create more uh, housing, and also? Um, protect existing housing? Uh, for San affordable Francisco. housing, sure. Um, and so I think we need to distinguish between affordable housing uh, and market rate housing. Market rate housing is in San Francisco today um, unaffordable to most working class people in this city. Um, we need to look at the fact that as a city, we have built nearly double the the, the goals for market rate housing and not even half the goals for affordable housing. So I will be proudly the affordable housing supervisor if I get into office. I believe that is what our city desperately needs right now. I do not subscribe to the theory that building housing that costs millions of dollars will trickle down uh, and benefit a low income and working class people. It hasn't worked in San Francisco. It won't work. I will prioritize building affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Brown. And could you hold your applause until we're all done? Thank you. Ms. Well, Brown. when you look at housing in District 5, we have created 430 units in 10 years. Now, you tell me if that creates a housing crisis. 430 units in 10 years. And this is apartments. This isn't, you know, uh, I'm talking about apartments. So when we're looking at building apartments, 
I just don't understand why people uh, who are tenant advocates are against apartments because tenants live in apartments. But one of the things that we have been doing on the Board of Soups is streamlining planning process. You know that when you're trying to build housing in this city or anything in this city, that we have this huge process. Um, I feel like we definitely need to keep, make sure we keep the community input because that's really important and I have seen many uh, developments become a lot better after the community input. Uh, but we also have to make sure that we protect tenants. I don't want to see anyone building anything that displaces tenants. So for me, it's, we're going to have to build housing and also, oh yes, and then also protect tenants. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. O'Meara, this next question sure. will be for you. Going along with housing, we also have rent control here in San Francisco. So the question came in, how do you propose differentiating between small and larger buildings with regard to rent control? And do you propose stronger or more lenient rent control? Well, I think there should be uh, st uh, stringent, more stricter laws protecting tenants uh, with regard to rent control. Um, currently, uh, there's a measure uh, for the state of California where voters will sign a petition to actually have rent control throughout the state of California. So I think that will be impactful for a lot of the residents when, when that ballot measure goes, um, uh, goes on the ballot. Uh, it's, and it's, it's, it's gonna come, it's gonna happen. Uh, there are restrictions with it because I believe that you have to have been a resident since 1995, so it may not accommodate everybody, but it's a start. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Preston? Uh, thank you. So I, I've spent the last 20 years uh, protect, fighting to protect rent control and protect people from eviction and displacement. And believe me, there is a constant real estate industry sponsored attempt to weaken rent control protections for tenants. It happens in the city constantly. Supervisors are presented with that and it happens at the state level. And I have been fighting against that and to protect rent control, which is rent control is the biggest reason that we still have a working class here in San Francisco. Um, I also uh, was the author of Proposition F last year, which is the right to counsel measure, uh, which guarantees any tenant in San Francisco the right to an attorney if they're facing eviction so that we don't have our rent control tenants being fraudulently driven out of their homes. That measure is expected to decrease evictions dramatically. It dropped them by almost 50% when the only other city in the country, New York, uh, did it. Uh, within a year, their evictions dropped almost 50%. Uh, so I will be a steadfast supporter of rent control and will not support any efforts to weaken it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, excuse me. Excuse me. I, <coughs> please, thank you. Ms. Brown. Can you please read the question? Sure, <laughs> I will. How do you propose differentiating between small and larger buildings with regard to rent control? Do you propose stronger or more lenient rent control? Well, I think everyone in San Francisco agrees that we do need rent control. It's something that we have to keep. It's something that we fight all the time at um, actually a state level because Costa Hawkins is a state level um, that keeps rent control or doesn't let, uh, it doesn't untie our hands. We need to untie our hands for certain things that we have to protect tenants. But until we can um, overturn Costa Hawkins, that's not gonna happen. So we're always on the Board of Supervisors looking at ways to protect tenants. One of the things that I did um, is I actually funded a housing odds busman. This is actually a mediator that any uh, tenant in uh, District 5 can use if they're having trouble with their landlord. And this is something I think is really important because yes, we give people a free attorney when we're, you know, they're getting evicted, but shouldn't we be working upstream and having someone work with the landlord and the tenant before it gets to an eviction? I mean, if anybody's been through an eviction, you know it's really stressful, whether you're a landlord or a tenant. So I am all about working upstream. And I also um, funded Open Door Legal to be in District 5 to also work with people. Thank you very much. Mr. Lamb. Hello. Um, I think there needs to be more lenient rent control laws. Right now it's currently at 2.2%, and that barely, that barely covers inflation in the United States. Um, 
An alternative, I think that uh, rent control could expand across uh, San Francisco. And I also think that we should have benefits to defray rental costs for tenants instead of, of certain policies. And like what Dean said, I am also for the right to counsel. However, I'm for the right to counsel for all. And it's usually on a defensive side. If somebody's making a lawsuit uh, to you, then you have free attorney to help you um, in housing matters. So. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Preston, this next question will be for you also on housing. As I indicated, there are many questions regarding this. Tell us about your commitment to building affordable housing in San Francisco and what sets you apart from the other candidates. What part do you see District 5 being in being part of that solution of affordable housing? I think District 5 has been an, a, uh, a leader in the, the further back past in, in providing affordable housing. Uh, the numbers, as the supervisor points out, are pretty grim in terms of our affordable housing production over the last decade. And I think that's one of the biggest reasons that we need a change uh, and not to be represented in District 5 uh, by the folks who've been con in control during that period of, of underproducing affordable housing. Um, I also believe very strongly that, that our city needs to embrace social housing, um, a, a, a different model of uh, affordable housing than we've done in the past. Uh, there are other countries that have much more successfully done, done this than the United States. Uh, if you look, for example, in Vienna, over 60% of the population lives in social housing. That's municipally owned and operated housing. If we are ever going to see a day in this city where rents are affordable and people have long-term stability, we're gonna have to do it with social housing and District 5 is a district that will support that and will support Thank the supervisor fighting for that. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Brown? Yes, and, and sorry, uh, Preston, but that was 430 units, everything. That's condos, apartments, ho affordable housing. That wasn't just affordable housing in the last 10 years. So I'm really the only candidate that has actually worked in affordable housing. I actually worked in it for two years after I left as a legislative aide. So I know exactly what it takes to build affordable housing. It's $800,000 to build one unit of affordable housing. This is, this is really expensive. And when we talk about social housing, we're talk, we already have social housing in District 5. We have the largest social housing complexes in District 5. They're called uh, HUD housing. They're the co-op model. And so we've done this before. It's not a brain surgeon. You don't need to be a brain surgeon to really figure this one out. But one of the things that um, I keep hearing is that how do you build housing? Look, $800,000 to build an affordable unit. We also should be buying existing buildings with tenants in them. This is our affordable housing stock too. So we have to start thinking different and creatively when we're thinking about affordable housing. Thank you very much. Mr. Lamb? So for affordable housing, I, I, I want to reach it. I want to build 1,000 1, plus units. Um, I, Valerie just said it costs 800000 to build one unit, but I think that we could do better than that. I think that we can upscale certain places. We can buy out um, unused or re, um, improve old buildings to house more people. And when it comes to social housing, um, I, I, I have to disagree because um, the problem with Social housing is eventually you're going to run out of other people's money. And uh, I think we stick to building more housing so that tenants have more options. They can choose where they want to live and choose the prices of where they want to live. And yes. OK, thank you very much, Mr. Lamb. Ms. O'Meara? Um, I think without trying to uh, reiterate um, some of the points that Dean <laughs> I think, um, without trying to reiterate some of the points um, that Dean Preston just made, I, I'm in agreement with the suggestion of uh, building or expanding affordable housing. Um, the numbers, though, that um, uh, uh, Valley gives to me are pretty not affordable at all. And what seems to be happening in the city, at least the dynamic, as far as our housing crisis goes, is there seem to be, seems to, appears to be a war of attrition 
between those that have and those that don't. So when you live here, like I do as a renter for 25 years, um, the looming prices of rent and price gouging and in the insecurity that I live with personally, as do most renters or millennials, is a, is a serious crisis. Um, so I think uh, whoever um, decides to be uh, eventually um, the final supervisor of City Hall needs to do a far more aggressive job than the one that's been currently done. I'm not impressed. Thank you very much. The next question will be for Ms. Brown. Yes. And we've spoken about housing, affordable uh, or market, um, but the question that always comes up is how we're gonna pay for it. So where would you look to enlarge or cut the city budget to deal with the issues that we have within the city of San Francisco? Well, I actually worked on a housing bond with the mayor and the other board of supervisors for $600 million uh, that's going to be on the ballot, Prop A. That is one way that we can help build affordable housing and buy existing buildings with tenants in them. But it's also um, looking at, uh, I actually did a blueprint and I found city land, private land. I actually found private land over at McDonald's when they wanted to sell on Haight and, uh, Haight and uh, Stanion. So we should be looking at city land to buy it on, uh, to build it on too. It's a lot cheaper to do that. But it's still, because of the cost of construction, it's still 800,000. So we have to look many different places of how we're gonna do that, but this affordable housing bond will help us with a start. And we also should put it in capital planning. We should put housing uh, funding in our capital planning. We've never done that before. This is what's really different, and people keep saying status quo, but we are actually doing different things as we move forward. It's not status quo. And I feel like um, as we move forward, people will see what's, hap what's gonna, uh, you know, what will happen. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Lamb, what would you do? How would you sure, sure. approach it? One thing I really don't like is inefficiency in City Hall. Uh, the city and county of San Francisco has 700 homelessness services, and each one of them with an executive director with, that gets paid 173000 on average. Uh, for but me, I'm going to cut half of that because I don't. I, homelessness has been on the rise, and and I don't, see, I don't see that helping. I see, I wanna find efficient, efi uh, efficient homelessness services, and then that money, that 173,000 from 700 homelessness services, I'm gonna use that to build affordable housing for our homeless and for hardworking renters. Um, when it comes to Proposition A, uh, I, I, I disagree with it. I, in the long run, we're gonna be paying over a billion dollars uh, selling these bonds and for affordable housing, so. Okay, but what would you do? How would you cut the budget or enlarge it to take care, make sure I the services that. were? Okay. okay, thank you very much. What Ms. O'Meara? What I do uh, that was different? Well, first of all, I think um, it helps that I don't come from, um, well, let's, let's just say this. I am more into creativity than I am into politics. So it's creativity that makes me, uh, ambitious about my dreams, uh, our dreams, our children's dreams, about what needs to be done. And I'll put it in very simple terms. Um, when FDR was president in this country, about a third of this country uh, was ill-housed, right? So that was part of the reason why he started the New Deal. And um, so my idea of what FDR has done is what needs to be implemented in San Francisco the serious housing crisis. The budgets that we have that are being proposed on the ballot in November, we need to assess some of those. If you're saying that Prop K, for instance, is a high seawall that needs to be built and requires 400 million, well, it's not really urgent. Reallocate some of those funds to what's really necessary. What's imperative is housing. Thank That's you very I much. I would shift the budget around. Thank you. Mr. Preston. 
Well, I, I think three points. First, the inclusionary housing program, which is requiring as much affordable housing from developers as possible. That's actually free to the city. And I've been at the forefront of every effort to increase the requirements on developers. And there is a reason that they, big developers are not behind me in this race, because I will continue making them build as much affordable as possible. Secondly, uh, housing bonds, which I have fought for affordable housing bonds at the state level, as well as at the local level, and was part of the push with progressive supervisors like Matt Haney to increase the affordable housing bond that was originally proposed by the mayor at $300 million. We called for it to be $1 billion, and through our, all of our advocacy, it's at $600 million, as the supervisor just mentioned. And the last thing is, we, there is an appetite in this city to tax the biggest corporations in this, in, in this country and in this city who have benefited mightily from the Trump tax breaks. We taxed them last year in Prop C to raise money to address homelessness, and we can tax them again. They, they always say they're going to leave town if you tax them, and it's Thank just you. not true. They're better off right now than they were before Trump, and we need Thank to take you. some of that money back for housing. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've spoken of housing, we've spoken of homelessness, and we've spoken, but we haven't spoken about our homeless youth. We have a question here. Haight-Ashbury is home to many homeless youth. What plans do you have to provide support and services for these youth in need? And we're gonna start with Mr. Lamb. So um, I wanna bring a, a formal navigation center to Lower Haight where people can register and and use the services there. I want to um, continue the services of people going around the city looking for homeless families, homeless youth, and giving them the, the resources to help them succeed or fi at least finish their high school education so that they can have a, have a job and, and start rebuilding themselves. When it comes to homeless youth, I, I was a homeless youth, so in 2017 I would be about 16 years old, and I had these services reach out to me, and they were really helpful. I, I didn't use them, but um, I, I would continue those, those resources for our homeless youth. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. O'Mara? Um, I, I think I would agree. I think uh, uh, Ryan offers some insight into uh, how he's dealt with it, and I, I kind of felt that personal sense and connection from him in describing that. I think that's very valuable, what he had to say. So I, I would go with some of the points he's made, which is um, uh, ensuring that the youth do complete their high school, because education is key, um, and, and go just beyond high school, make sure that there are programs within high school, uh, whether they have a vocational skill, they should need to start really early. We really need to assess the education as it's done in our public school system. It needs to be diverse, it needs to be varied, it needs to address that when, so, so not everybody has to go to college, they may go and learn a skill somewhere. That's very key. I think the, in, the iniquities of uh, affordability are also impacted by the lack of education. And that's key. So in that respect, I do agree with you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Preston? Thanks. Uh, my priorities, first off, would be to stop the sweeps and the criminalization of uh, homelessness uh, that is occurring. Um, I think it's ineffective. I think it's immoral. And I think it's a waste of taxpayer money. Uh, second thing we need in the hate is uh, the Homeless Youth Alliance has been without uh, a permanent site in the hate for, for years now. It's ridiculous, and we need some advocacy from our supervisor's office to find them a permanent location. It's an amazing organization doing essential work. Uh, third, we need a navigation center in District 5. We've now been promised that uh, since I first raised it in 2016. Uh, year after year, we're told we're going to get a navigation center. Everyone agrees we need one, uh, and we still don't have one. Uh, last thing I would say is the McDonald's site is frankly an embarrassment. Uh, that is a site, there was a, a strong proposal from the community, there were two community proposals. One of them actually involved uh, public uses as well as services for transitional age youth. Uh, would have been a great idea. The city abruptly withdrew the RFP, so we have a year and a half of a vacant lot, and Thank we'll promise to have years more of a vacant lot instead of something Thank that serves those youth. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Brown? Yes. 
When I first came into office, I brought Take It to the Streets to Haight-Ashbury. Take It to Streets is an organization that works with the homeless youth. They actually pay them and find them housing. So that's been going on for uh, about eight months, and that's something that's working. As far as a navigation center, we're looking for navigation centers, but where? I mean, the thing with uh, McDonald's is that when this housing bond passes, we're, that will be breaking ground within a year and a half, two years, because I already put the pre-development money in there. So you have to have, uh, if you put millions of dollars in a navigation center, they want it three to five years. So it's actually where, but really we need to build housing for our transitional age youth. Just like when I worked to build bo uh, for Booker T. Washington for aged out foster youth. That was something that we need to do. We need housing for, for the homeless youth because if anyone's going to get out of this homeless cycle, it's our transitional age youth. But we have to have housing for them and education and jobs. And also we have a Tay navigation, I mean a Tay um, housing um, uh, program or actually project that's being built, uh, that's going to be built in Hayes Valley. Thank so these are the things that we need. Okay, thank you very mm -hmm. much. And cons continuing on on the issue of um, homelessness, I've got a question here that it appears Supervisor Haney has legislation or has proposed legislation to create a commission overseeing homeless services. Mm -hmm. Are you, do you support um, this legislation? or if you don't, why, why or why not? When, and, uh, and excuse when, me. Was it me? No, no, it not me. yet. Oh, It's Miss O'Mara. Oh, okay. Okay, uh, would you uh, reiterate the question again, please? Sure. Do you support Supervisor Haney's legislation to create a commission overseeing homeless services? Why or why not? I certainly support Supervisor Haney's um, um, uh, well, proposed, uh, his proposed legislation uh, to have a housing commission, is that correct? Homelessness. A, a, a homeless uh, commission. It's homeless services commission, it looks like. Ho homeless services commission is, uh, is, is imperative. Uh, I do support it. Um, based on, um, uh, I'll reiterate uh, some of my stances. I think that uh, we discussed Prop C a little bit and um, Dean touched on some issues about uh, it having increased that, Prop C raised about 300 million towards the housing. There was, um, it, it was, it got a vote of about 60, 40. Two thirds would have made it with less entanglements. A lot of that money is tied up. So by having a homeless coalition, I believe, a commission, commission. Um, it, is, it is imperative to impact that gap that's required in, in the housing crisis. Thank you. Mr. Preston? I, I fully support uh, Supervisor Haney's proposal. I think it's absolutely essential. Um, right now, really two people direct and decide about all of our homelessness money. It's the mayor uh, and Jeff Kaczynski, the head of the homelessness department. Uh, that's it. Uh, this commit hundreds that's of millions That's too much of power dollars. for just two people. Excuse me. Yeah. Hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, controlled by two people. And so what the Homelessness Commission would do is have actual oversight of how those funds are being spent, have transparency. Um, and this is one I just want to emphasize. I think it's essential that District 5, whoever you pick, be independent of our mayor. And when it comes to things like the Homelessness Commission, it, it is clear the mayor is strongly opposed because she wants exclusive control over how all this money is spent. I disagree with that, and, my, and, and our, uh, the incumbent supervisor cast the deciding vote to kill that Homelessness Commission legislation. It's a huge difference uh, between us. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Brown? Yes, the majority of the supervisors actually had uh, voted against it because we, it wasn't that we vote that we were against the commission, we were against the timeline. The mayor had asked us to wait till March to actually uh, put it, uh, bring it forward, and we said yes. And that was the majority of the board of supervisors. When the mayor asks you to do something like that for a few more months, why not? And the fact that the supervisors do not have any control over the budget, that's not true. I actually put money in the budget for uh, Take It to the Streets. I actually put money in to open up uh, Project uh, Homeless Connect in St. Mark's. So this that the mayor is held all control is not correct once again. Um, and I actually supported Prop C. 
I legislated that we have a propsy commission and oversight commission. And that's uh, going to be starting to show, so we can actually know how to spend that money when it comes in. I also did legislation that any company that wants to give us, let us spend the money now for propsy, that they will let us. We have two companies that's doing it, and that's around 14 million so far. Thank, thank you very much. Mr. Lamb? So are you for or against the, the Homeless Commission? Yeah, I said we, we, we said, and I don't think we're supposed to do this, but okay, my, okay, my okay. was no. we were waiting till March. We, we'd like your idea. Yeah. Okay, okay. I am 100% supportive of this Homeless Commission. I, as long as it makes sure that these homelessness services, they have integrity, they're efficient, and they check whether or not that these services are actually needed and used by the homelessness or the homeless people. Um, the city and county have a record of funding a lot of third party third party organizations such as the CBD and Green and Benefit Districts that just redo the the jobs that the city and county promised to do. So this homeless commission, I want to make sure that there's divided leadership on that so that they can make a good decision on how to spend the money and make sure that the money is spent actually helping homeless people. Thank you very much, Mr. Lamb. Mr. Preston, this next question is for you. We're going to move into the issue of crime. Um, could you tell us, what will you do to help lower crime in the district and be as specific as you can? Sure. Uh, so we obviously have a rise in high levels of, of car break-ins, property crime, as well as increasing gun violence uh, in the district, uh, particularly in the Fillmore with uh, two shootings uh, right near the, the police station. Let me just say right off the bat, I don't think ramping up uh, police presence, um, police budgets, and incarcerating people for a longer period of time is the right approach. I think that's the failed approach, and that's what's put us uh, where we are. That doesn't mean we don't do anything about crime. It means we have to take a different approach. We have to take a harm reduction and prevention approach to crime. So when we're looking at uh, something like uh, gun violence or even something like car break-ins, we have to look at not just uh, police and punishment, but non-police units that can address, uh, that, that can work on prevention. So I look across the bay to what Richmond, California did when they created an Office of Neighborhood Safety that actually hired neighborhood advocates, created fellows of people who were likely to commit gun violence and had them checking in daily with the neighborhood advocate, Thank turned the city you. from one of the worst uh, violent crime rates in the country uh, around in just a few years. We have Thank to start you. taking that kind of approach in San Francisco. Thank you very much, Mr. Preston. Ms. Brown? Well, we actually had six shootings, uh, Dean Preston. Um, and um, one of the things that we actually have done in this district, because we actually really turned this district around. Most of you know, years ago, it was really violent. And what we did is we put beat officers on the street so they would get to know people and they would, you know, engage with people. I pushed to put more officers on the street this last budget uh, cycle. We also have to make sure there's programs there for people to have choices and get opportunities. We have that program. It's called Mo Magic. Mo Magic, Preston. So I'm just saying, you know, you talk about some program in Richmond. We have these programs right now Excuse in me. the Western Edition. So I just want to make sure that when we're talking about the violence and the things that we've done, I'm really proud of the district. And we've also stepped up. The community has stepped up with this recent violence. And we've also done peace marches. We've gone through public housing and other areas saying, that this is not acceptable. And the community, it's the community that actually makes the, the neighborhoods safe. Thank you very much. And also, I ask, I ask you again, before we get to Mr. Lamb, I ask you again to be respectful of, the, um, of our candidates up here. This is a lot of hard work, y'all. And so, you know, and they're up here trying to answer your questions, and we want to get as many done as we possibly can. So I think we can do this. Okay, Mr. Lamb, what will you do to help lower crime in the district? All right, all right. Be spe as specific as you can. Sure, sure, sure. Um, last month I was at the Freedom West Homes, and, and one of the main things they were talking about were car break-ins and crime and how to prevent it. 
just take precautions. But I do think that enforcement and funding the police is a good way to stop crime. I mean, you look at BART, when there's a police present at the, at the entrances, you see 80% 80 de 80 decrease in fare evasion. Um, I hate to say it, but when it comes to gun violence, <coughs> shootings in school happen because schools are gun-free zones and it takes a lot more time for, for policemen to get there and actually find a strategy to take out a gunman. So it, I think police enforcement is very critical and I think there needs to be a better, smarter punishment for, um, for people who have committed crime, especially younger people. Um, I, I definitely agree with uh, taking out Juvie. Um, I think it was an interesting move by um, City Hall. So um, that's, thank my, that's my vote. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Ms. O'Mara? Well, I think uh, almost everyone has touched on some very sensitive um, issues here regarding the police. I'm going to keep my answer really simple. I think the process needs to be community-based, um, just as Dean suggested. I think having some sort of neighborhood watch that is all-inclusive and diverse is, is a better problem to the, a better solution to the problem than what, what happens is, I've lived in District 5, uh, three different places, Forest Hill, um, in a sunset for eight years, and um, uh, the Lower Hate, where I live for 10 years. So I think I have a fair sense of my neighbors, who they are in District 5. And I think taking a more, uh, what I call a humanist approach to protection is, um, is more palpable uh, for neighbors. Sometimes, in, in certain communities in District 5, a strong police presence tends to, um, uh, people may cast aspersions on police for historical reasons that we all know, um, and I don't need to be here giving you a lecture on that, but um, I think you, you understand what I mean. Thank you very much. Okay, the next question will be for Ms. Brown. Um, there have been uh, police shootings in San Francisco in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and what's your position on what we should do or what the Board of Supervisors can do to address police shootings in San Francisco? I think it has to really be retraining the police. The training that they have received is something that, well, especially with Mario Woods, I think when you watch that tape and you watch them surround Mario Woods, that was the way they were trained, and I think they completely need new training. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I don't agree with tasers. Um, that's something that I am against. And I just feel that uh, we have to really look at the police in a different way. I have to say, you know, when I was a legislative aide and we actually had, um, you know, youth that were committing violent crimes, there were cops, beat cops, that knew these youth. And one youth had a, um, uh, a gun strapped around him, and the cops had him surrounded. But he was lifting the gun to, to throw it down because he was only 14. And the, because the cop knew who he was, he told the other cops, don't shoot. This is what we need. We need the police to understand and engage the youth, the community, uh, to make sure that everyone's safe. Thank you very much. Mr. Lamb? One thing I support is, again, training. I think that police need, similar to Starbucks and, and um, other companies, I think they need weeks off to make sure that they're following procedures. It's more like yearly you have one week off to do training again to make sure that discrimination or some other effect may not be interfering with your police proce procedures. I'm also against tasers. I, of course, I, I speak with uh, so many police officers, and their belts are filled. They have their batons. They have their they have their walkie-talkies, and of course, they have their guns. And many have told me that they don't necessarily need tasers, but um, and they have nowhere to place it. So uh, I don't see the need for that. And I, I and of course, they have their guns and. Uh, I just want to make sure that police officers are, are following procedures and following commands of higher, um, higher officers. Thank you very much. Ms. O'Meara? Um, well, I, 
I definitely agree that there is, um, there is well, there's a, a requirement for intensive police training and perhaps introducing some new um, measures or a new way to look at things, but there definitely needs to be a training that's different from the past. I'll give an example. Racial profiling, as we know, does happen in the city. It happens a lot, even in neighborhoods that used to be highly dangerous. So um, maybe they need to look at the, the current curriculum that the police has, and um, it needs to be on a whole refresher course. That's one instance. The second one is I want to share with everybody, uh, about two weeks ago I was invited to a Nancy Pelosi uh, town hall meeting, and I joined a women's organization there called Moms Demand Action. It's a very powerful con uh, uh, organization. It's larger than the uh, National Rifle Association. And I think I'm learning from them. I got a call from them today in Virginia. They're very effective in educating the public about gun laws and um, in enforcing stricter gun laws, et cetera. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Mr. Preston? Yeah, I, I started my legal career uh, in, in the late 90s representing victims of police misconduct, both in the East Bay and in San Francisco, and that was before most things were caught on, on videotape. Um, I have been regularly out protesting uh, police shootings at, and joining the, the hunger strikers who, who are demanding the resignation of Chief Sir um, back uh, in the Mission District. And, and let me say, I think this is one where our races interact, interact with the district attorney's race. Uh, I think we need a district attorney who is willing to prosecute uh, police officers uh, that shoot and kill people. And I also want to say, I, I support the kind of training that we're hearing. Uh, uh, others support, but I want to be clear, there's also a harm reduction side for the community, which is limiting the police contacts. Uh, I, forgive me if I don't have faith in a department that has been so deeply racist for so long that from my perspective, the more we can have non-police units interacting with people of color in this city, the more likely we are to avoid police shootings as thank, we continue to train police you. officers. Thank you very much. Um, still in the, um, speaking of, in the area of crime, um, and we're gonna start with Mr. Lamb. What is your position on open air, open air drug sales and how would you crack down on drug dealers? Um, open air, Okay, so again, police and I, I support police enforcement. I support the funding of police, but um, other than for that, I everything that's illegal um, in in open sailing of marijuana, open sailing of illegal drugs. I want to make sure that there's a crackdown on that. Um, could you could you be more specific about your question? I just, I just read it as it was. It's okay, written. sure, sure, sure. <laughs> what, what is if it's position? illegal, yeah. I want to make sure it's not here in San Francisco. Okay, thank you very much. Ms. O'Mara? Um, I think having lived in these dif uh, different districts, I, I've learned a lot about my current D5 neighborhood, and it comes with a whole history that needs to be reevaluated and understood. Having lived in the Fillmore and... Uh, what's now called the lower hate. Um, it's interesting, it's interesting that, um, of course I'm concerned about open drug sales. Obviously, I don't want to be exposed to it. I don't want to be around it. I don't want my children around it. It's a problem. But what we need to reevaluate re and assess is, historically, what went wrong post-civil rights? We know that there was a war of attrition between people who are trying to progressively um, get their rights, their constitutional right to be acknowledged, to have food programs so their children could have a better education. And that movement was um, stifled and, and was uh, uh, repressed back in the late 60s and 70s. And we know that whether it was the Panther movement or the different women's movement, there was a whole slew of organizations, uh, particularly here in, in San Francisco, that came about is that. So Thank when you start you. to look at the problem of drugs and drug sales, Thank take you. into regard what happened before that. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Mr. Preston? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we can't look at this without looking at, at the history, as Namvula uh, alluded to. I mean, we're looking at 
uh, decades of a failed war on drug that, that war on drugs that's resulted in mass incar incarceration. Um, you know, if you're looking for a supervisor that's going going to further the mass incarceration by pushing for uh, arrests and long sentences for street uh, level uh, uh, drug sales, I, I, I may not be your guy. I mean, I think that that the reality is, if we're going to focus our prosecutorial resources and our police, we should be focusing it much higher up in the food chain of the folks that are, are bringing the, the illegal drugs into to our streets and not punishing a lot of folks who uh, really lack economic opportunity and are engaged in, in street level dealing. At the end of the day, though, similar to my previous responses, we need to offer something better to the folks who are selling uh, illegal drugs on the street uh, so that they opt into that as opposed to thinking that crime and punishment is uh, that punishment and sentences are going to solve it. Thank, thank you very much. Um, this next question, uh, we're going to start with you, Ms. O'Meara, sure. um, and it's a change up. So, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Oh no, it's not. <laughs> like, hmm, did I'm I getting, speak my I'm getting minute? ahead of myself. I forgot. I'm sorry. Thank you, audience. <clears throat> Ms. Brown. Yes. Um, you know, we have, uh, regarding the criminal rings that come in and bring the drugs, there's a real problem. And I know I've been talking to Supervisor Haney about it because the Tenderloin is, is on fire with that. So we really have to kind of separate that out. You have the criminal rings that are coming in, and I definitely feel law enforcement should step up. Absolutely. But then you have the street dealing. Now, this is where we need to have programs come in and take people aside and get them into programs, whether that the, most of them have their own um, drug uh, abuse issues. We need to be able to get them aside, get them into programs, and then put, give them opportunities. It really has to work hand in hand. You can't just go out and do hardcore enforcement without giving opportunities. And this is something that the city has been looking at and been working on. And, uh, but we definitely need to go after the criminal rings because they actually they actually um, uh, are predators to our people on the street. Thank you very much. Okay, um, this next question. We're gonna speak of um, something near and dear to my heart, aging. So, um, <laughs> how, and we're gonna start with Ms. O'Mara. How will you support those aging and living with their disabilities here in San Francisco? <clears throat> You mean when I am supervisor? Yes. <laughs> um, how would I support? Well, the current uh, status um, of the aging, as I've observed, I uh, worked in mental health, as I said, in dual diagnosis programs. So we have, I had a very uh, clientele of, um, in, in that population. Um, it's a difficult one, but it's critical to this city that we uh, um, provide housing to our seniors. Um, they are less able to move around. And I think an interest in our elders is, is a connection from the past to the future. The youth being the future, the elders being the ones that pass on that knowledge. It's very important for a collective kind of consciousness. So. My, um, my, sorry, my take on that is it's one of, it's not just a moral imperative to provide housing and uh, disability to them. We, we owe it to our seniors. Thank you very much. Mr. Preston? Yeah, we have a, certainly have a housing crisis, affordability crisis for everyone, but we have an affordability uh, and housing crisis for seniors uh, that is really acute. We also have a crisis in terms of uh, long-term care in the city where folks, um, there are simply not enough uh, beds uh, for for folks or places for people to stay and people end up moving to, uh, to different counties disconnected uh, from their communities. So housing and safe shelter, absolutely essential uh, 
uh, for us to seriously uh, invest in that for our seniors. Um, but I also think that there are a number of other issues that disproportionately impact seniors. Um, certainly pedestrian safety is a huge issue for our aging population with most of our serious injuries and, and deaths in District 5 uh, from folks walking on the streets, uh, our folks who are seniors near senior centers. Um, and so I think we need to look at uh, not just the housing issues, but the, the safety and stability of, of seniors as a top priority for any supervisor in San Francisco. Thank you very much. And Ms. Brown? Yes. I mean, seniors are, are a fastest growing population in this city, so we really have to really look at what we need to do. We also, besides housing and on the housing bond, um, the 600 million housing bond that I actually worked on, um, there will be uh, money for senior housing. We need appropriate housing. I talk to many seniors every day, and one of the things they say is like, look, I have rent control, uh, but I have you know, 50 stairs up to get to my apartment, and I have a hard time managing that. So we have to build the right kind of senior housing so people can actually have elevators and have senior services on site. And this is something that we're, we're doing with, props, uh, with Prop A, but also, we have to look at transportation because a lot of seniors give up cars or you know they actually start using transportation a lot more. We have to make it safe. Unless we have safe transportation and it's reliable, immunity is reliable, uh, seniors are, most of us won't use this, but especially seniors. So there's a lot of things that we need to do and, and that's what we're pushing for. Thank you very much, Mr. Lamb. Yes, one of my priorities is safety, as I mentioned, and um, with my intensive infrastructure improvement plan, I want to make sure that um, streets, lights, and timers are provided near senior centers. I live near two senior centers with no timers that you just sort of just walk across the street. And um, something, something bad can happen there because a, a senior on their uh, wheelchair could take more time than an average pedestrian. Um, I, I want to continue the pensions and benefits that seniors receive given by California and the city and county of San Francisco. And I want to make sure that everyday activities, seniors going to buy, go to the grocery market or go into the park, I want to make sure that they're accessible. That means having, um, having senior um, accommodations on transportation. Thank you very much. Ms. O'Meara? I'm um, sorry. There's one thing that everybody left out, and it had got me thinking a little while back on the senior issue. I just I would like to, people to hear it and know how you, you respond. Um, wellness centers is one thing I associate with seniors. Uh, I know this from personal experience because having lived with my in-laws a uh, little Excuse while back. Hold on. I went I'll be really quick. But the wellness center is critical to the well-being of seniors. When you have a pool, Thank a you. gym, a jacuzzi, it's critical within that affordable housing range. That's something that needs to be implemented. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I went out of order, but you had answered already. But thank you for that information. Um, and it was spoken about when dealing with um, seniors that uh, traffic is an issue. Crossing the streets can be an issue. So um, starting with Mr. Preston, what is your plan to address traffic problems in District 5? The question being, crossing Octavia by foot is dangerous. Yeah, the, the streets are incredibly unsafe despite, uh, despite the Vision, Vision Zero plan. We're five years into what's supposed to be a 10-year plan uh, to eliminate uh, fatalities and serious injury for pedestrians, uh, and they are not going down. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, I am a, I'm an everyday Muni rider, have been for the last 26 years. I believe that we need to be investing uh, in public transportation. I think we also need to be standing up to uh, Uber and Lyft, uh, who have privatized and congested and made our streets uh, far less safe. Uh, I've never ordered an Uber or Lyft in my life. I don't plan to, and I object 
strongly to Uber's business plan, which is to take people off of public transportation and put them into private uh, vehicles. They have admitted that that is their business plan in their SEC filings. Uh, so I think these things are what are congesting the city. Again, if you privatize public transportation and if you can make a lot of money privatizing public transportation, you're going to see the results, which is a congested city that's unsafe Thank for folks who are cyclists and pedestrians. Thank you very much. Ms. Brown? Well, yes, and I mean, one of the things with uh, Vision Zero is a lot of times we get pushback from neighbors. I mean, that's really truthful. Um, you know, we want to take out a parking space so we have uh, people can see you uh, on the corner. So there's a lot of things we need to do with Vision Zero and to push forward. I mean, I think one of the things we need to do is really look at not having people be able to turn right on a red light. I think that's something. And then also on the larger streets like Divisadero, we should have left-hand designated uh, turning uh, because uh, that's one of the reasons that a woman, 80-year-old woman, was killed on uh, Divisadero. Someone was trying to uh, rush through the traffic, those two lanes of traffic, and hit her while they were turning left. So these are the things that we need to do. We need to do those fast. But um, I think that we are, the Board of Supervisors have said, we want to push v Vision Zero much faster, and we need to do that. And it's not only for pedestrians, because whether you ride a bike, you ride Muni, you're a pedestrian. So we really need to do uh, this kind of uh, work as fast as possible. Thank you very much. Mr. Lamb? Yes, yeah, so, so I agree. Um, I think for bikers and pedestrians, again, my um, improvement in infrastructure, I think that if you put a sign or you put a light up, it's going to stay there for over 20 years, maybe. Um, and I just you have a sign there, and you can't turn right. People will know, and uh, hopefully there, we reach Vision Zero someday. And if you want better, um, more people riding public transportation instead of driving, I think we need to incentivize that. I think we need better transportation, and more people will flock towards public transportation. So that means paying muni drivers better. That means um, instituting the, the improvements that BART has been making on BART. Um, they're, they're adding new cars and making sure that these, the public transportation arrives in a timely manner with, without it being c completely packed with people and uh, in, in rush hour. So improving public transportation will have more people riding public transportation. Thank you Simply. very much. Thank you. Ms. O'Meara? Oh, are we just attributing this uh, transportation problem just to the Octavia Corridor or just no. in general? G traffic problems in general. Well, um, <clears throat> I think um, I, I talked to um, some of my neighbors uh, last week about this transport situation in the city and these all uh, new demarcations. And I understand the need for uh, uh, bikers. I'm a biker myself, et cetera, um, and that there are changes. One thing I want to share with you, what my constituency said is, who are these people that are being hired by City Hall when this person comes from Washington, D.C., and what do they know about the streets in San Francisco or how they're designing them or what kind of outreach is being done by SFMTA? In fact, there's not enough consultation or none. So we, in fact, need to re-examining that by asking the question, um, who are, if SFMTA is the one responsible, together with Valley's job uh, as supervisor, then they are not doing their job. They are not, um, they're not connecting with the community or advising them timeously. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, um, again, um, I know or I've heard uh, in watching, if I watch TV all the time, I'd hear it constantly about Uber and Lyft in the city. So the question is, how can the Board of Supervisors influence the planning department and the SFMTA to consider the impacts of Uber, Lyft, and the commute buses that go through the city? And Ms. Brown, you... Uh, okay. your question. Well, yes. we've already had those studies, and we know that's a huge impact. We have around 30,000 Uber drivers a day in this city. So what we have to do is we have to make sure transportation works. So when I first got into City Hall, I called a hearing because Muni wasn't working. 
Uh, you stand on Carl and Cole and people are waiting for bus and you see the time keep going up and up and all of a sudden people peel off and they're taking Uber and Lyft. So if it doesn't work, it's not gonna be used. One of the things that the hearing showed was that we're 400 drivers a day short. We spent millions and millions of dollars on buses and trains, but none on the drivers. So one of the things, uh, and how can we have a uh, reliable muni if we don't have operators? So one of the things I did was I worked to make sure that the muni operators had a fair contract, they have a fair contract. They just had their first class a few weeks ago, ago with this new contract, and we had 80 people in this class before it was only like 20 people because Muni wasn't make it, making enough money. We were training the drivers and then they would leave after 18 months and go get a better job somewhere else. So we have to be able to have drivers to have a reliable Muni. Thank you very much. And Mr. Lamb? Uh, how about you repeat the question so that we stay on track? Yeah. How can the Board of Supervisors influence the Planning Department and the SFMTA to consider the impacts of Uber, Lyft, and commute buses? Well, I'm sure they do know the effects of Uber and Lyft. Um, there's obviously a, a proposition going out right now, I believe it's Proposition D or F, I forget. But, um, okay, okay. Um, I'm against that. Um, Uber and Lyft was, was not made for everyday transit. It's not made to go to work and back. Um, it's more made for visitors and people going from point A and point B. Um, Uber drivers make about 3000 3, a month, or Uber and Lyft drivers make about $3,000 a month, which is not affordable. And eventually, they're, they're just going to die out because 3000 if you do the math, 12 times 12, that's about less than 30000 So, um, <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm not a mathematician here. So. Okay, okay. So, in, yeah, again, improving public transportation. We need more muni drivers. We need to pay them better, and we may, uh, need to make sure that their contracts are good. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Ms. O'Mara? I think that, um, first of all, I have a problem with the lack of uh, transparency uh, within the SFMTA as uh, well as how uh, a supervisor deals with it. And I'm going to give you a case in point. In my neighborhood, right on my block, there's a proposed um, a pilot program um, <clears throat> which is supposed to take place sometime in the fall, over 18 months. The problem with it is where I live, it's a house, a nice house. So are th where my neighbors who've owned their houses for 50 something years. Now, part of that proposal says uh, between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., they will be, the only Muni will have access to that block. But we have a corner store where an aging gentleman and his wife who have run the store for over 40 years, how are they going to park? How are we going to park to drop off our kids or any of that? And it doesn't make any sense. If it's fixed, if, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And so um, I, I believe that... Um, Ms. Uh, Supervisor Brown needs to really reassess that program because Thanks. it's going to harshly affect our, my neighbors. Thank That's you very much. And Mr. Preston? Yeah, I mean, we've heard that 30,000 of these cars at least are on the street, and then we've also pretty much heard that the incumbent's not planning to do anything about that other than investing in muni, which I think we can all agree we need to do. But I, I think I take a pretty different perspective. Uh, maybe it's from having tackled some pretty big issues over a 20-year career that folks say are impossible when we start, like last year when we did Prop C uh, for homelessness, like when we did Prop F. Uh, for, to tackle a right to counsel and countless other things where people say, oh, you just need to leave these corporations alone and accept what they're doing, taking over your streets. I mean, come on, what are we electing a supervisor to do if not, if we all agree there's a problem with 30,000 vehicles, let's deal with it. Now, the supervisor will respond, you can't directly regulate the numbers because of state law. Sure, but that doesn't mean the Board of Supervisors is powerless to address it. I mean, AB5 just passed in the state. Uber is going to violate that. That law will, the city is going to need to enforce that law against Uber. 
it reclassifies their independent contractors as, as, empl as employees. The city also can take aim at Uber and Lyft, the corporations, for a business practice that violates our local traffic laws. Thank let's, you. let's, as a city, sue them, get an injunction, and force them to geofence so they don't pick up and drop Thank off you. in violation of local Thank law. You. Let's do something. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Climate change, another issue that's in the uh, news. We have a bay where water will probably be rising over the next years. So starting with Mr. Lamb, how do you plan to make San Francisco a greener and safer city in light of climate change? Okay. Well, my model is uh, a cleaner and safer San Francisco, so I'm going to stick to that. Um, Keeping our streets clean. Greener, I mean, greener. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm going to get to that. <laughs> so um, having, having um, you know, walking down the streets, I, I see so much litter and, and homelessness. And I want to make sure that organizations like Downtown uh, Street Cleanup or, or um, some of these organizations that are employing people of who, who haven't had opportunity to clean up the, to get them jobs, clean up the streets, and keep the environment clean when it comes to and climate change. Of course, the most, of course, it's all talked about. Transportation is the number one thing affecting climate change because of the carbon dioxide. Again, the public transportation needs to improve so that many more people use public transportation and that it's not all packed. So there's more cars, less delays, and it's run on a tight schedule. So um, thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. O'Meara? Well, I think the uh, carbon emissions uh, definitely impact um, our city. And, and that's uh, probably due to the um, increased uh, congestion of Uber and Lyft. Um, but there's, there are ways, too, to regulate that. And also, um, <clears throat> when we, we have um, companies like Google or whatever, and I believe they used to pay the city $250,000 to pick up their employees. I think that we should get more money from them than what they currently pay. Um, but uh, I, I definitely think that um, the carbon emissions um, uh, impacting cli climate change has been caused by this avalanche of uh, cars um, that aren't even necessarily residents uh, of the city. Thank you very much. Mr. Preston? Well, I'm first off, obviously, huge supporter of Green New Deal nationally, and thanks to the Democratic Socialists who are pushing that forward nationally, I'd like to do a Green New Deal for San Francisco, capturing a similar spirit. Um, it, huge props to the community activists who for decades have been fighting for public power, and we're now seeing uh, that we may be on the verge of actually municipalizing PG&E, at least as far as electricity goes, which is very exciting. Uh, and I'm certainly going to support that on the board. Um, I think, you know, regionally and locally, the biggest cause of, of pollution is transportation, so we need to tackle that in a big way. Um, I want to do a November 2020 ballot measure uh, on public transportation. The vision for our public transportation has got to be that you can get on anywhere in San Francisco and 30 minutes later arrive at your destination. We need 30-minute trips in San Francisco. We also need to reverse our decades-long fare hikes. Every year it goes up. It's totally unfair to the people who ride Muni, who should be being thanked for riding Muni, not forced to pay more and more. We should chop fares in half with a ballot measure, taxing the biggest corporations next year, and work toward free Muni in San Francisco in five Thank years. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ms. Brown. Well, you know, 46% of uh, emissions is actually from large buildings. And I actually legislated that large buildings would have to, and uh, by, 2020, by 2024, actually go clean. So clean energy, electric reusable, uh, electric reusable, uh, solar, and, things, and other things to really make sure that our buildings are clean. 47% uh, are cars. And as we said, you know, Uber and Lyft, this is regulated by the state. Do you think that 
my colleagues, including Aaron Peskin, would not go after Uber if we could. <laughs> I mean, this is ridiculous to think that if you know somebody gets on there, they're going to tackle this. This is actually run by the state PUC, and I really wish we could really educate people to know what we have to do. We have to make sure Muni is reliable. Can it be free? Look, we already have seniors, disability, disabled um, youth that are free. We've also studied that can we ma make Muni free? We all, uh, Gavin Newsom did it and, and then uh, Mayor Lee and we found out that Muni would collapse if it was free. So this is the kind of things that we're dealing with right now. Thank you very much. Ms. O'Mara, this next question, um, how will you reach out to and work with low-income communities here in the city? Well, uh, <clears throat> this seems to be uh, a deficit in um, our outreach towards low-income communities, primarily um, black, brown, LGBTQ uh, youth uh, populations. Uh, therefore, that means that there needs to be some aggressive outreach towards those communities. I am around or surrounded by some of those communities, and I see the problem. Part of the problem is also, the, like I said, low-performing schools. And I spoke to the principal of the school close to my house, and she said that there had uh, been an improvement, in fact, um, in the school's performance. But we need more of it because we have a a generation of people who were caught up um, uh, in the 80s and 90s with uh, a lot of the aftermath of the civil rights movement got caught up in that whole drug culture. And um, basically it was a, a kind of a holocaust of, of uh, black people Thanks. that were either incarcerated or they were Thanks. deprived of um, opportunities to succeed in life. And thank that's, you very that's a much. historical fact. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Preston? Well, I've been working directly with uh, low-income individuals, and clients, and communities for uh, the, over the last 20 years as a, a housing advocate, uh, working with folks who are struggling uh, in the city and across the state. Um, I think you start by working with low-income communities in a way uh, that this city doesn't do often enough, which is actually listening to low-income communities, holding real community meetings, not meetings that are just designed to roll out your latest plan, uh, to do things to communities. And I wanna point to SB 50, which is a real difference between myself and, and the uh, appointed incumbent around, um, you know, that to me is a, SB 50 is a state law that would basically take away neighborhood voices and low-income communities communities in San Francisco and across the state have made clear that they oppose this kind of upzoning of their neighborhoods that doesn't increase affordable housing and takes away their voice. And I believe we need to be fighting against things like SB 50 at the state level and to defend the neighbors' voices in San Francisco, especially Thank in low-income communities and communities of color. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Brown? Well, regarding SB 50, um, I, I think you mischaracterized my position on that. My position was that we should be working with our state representatives to make sure that we get what we need in amendments for it. Because once something passes at the state, we cannot change it. We have, have to follow that law. So we have to be able to work with our state representatives, whether we like them or not. We have to be able to sit down with them and work out amendments to say, this is what we need in the city. I did that with Senator Weiner, and one of it was community outreach and community input, and he was fine with that. He actually, we did eight different amendments that he was fine with. Was regarding um, outreach for, for uh, communities of color, you really have to be boots on the ground. If you don't know the community, you are not going to do very good outreach. And I've always been boots on the ground. Every, people know me in the community, and you have to walk through the community, you have to talk to everybody, you have to go into public housing, you have to go into all kinds of housing and talk to people, go into, the, into businesses. This is what we, what we expect in District 5, boots on the ground. That is the only kind of outreach you can do effectively. Thank you very much. And Mr. Lamb? Oh, is it my turn? No, no, Mr. Lamb. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay, it's okay. So uh, one thing about SB 50 is uh, somebody once told me, or I quote, uh, you don't amend a dead bill, you kill it. But that's that. Um, for, um, 
So um, I think giving low-income families and, and um, citizens a second chance and opportunity is, is very important. I've seen it with uh, Civic Center Commons. I see it with um, many other organizations. And I think that the creation of jobs that we need in San Francisco is critical. Um, we can create more jobs to focus on keep, keeping our cities safe and clean and give it to people who need a second chance, who have been incarcerated and want to re completely restart their life and start living, um, start being law-abiding citizens. And about, I want to make sure that we keep kids in school from low-income uh, families making sure that they at least finish high school and if they have the chance they go on to free city college so thank you yeah. thank you very much um, mr. Preston this question is for you um, how would you protect the LGBTQ community from discrimination and housing and other city services especially in light of what's going on in the country yeah Thank you, and I, I'm proud to be the sole endorsed candidate of the Harvey Milk Democratic Club and appreciate their, their strong uh, support, and I've been fighting to protect uh, LGBTQ residents from eviction, displacement, and from housing discrimination. Um, and that is really, it's essential to understand that uh, even in San Francisco, uh, that L the LGBTQ community is regularly subject to, uh, to discrimination in housing um, and in, in the workplaces. Um, one of the reasons we did Prop F was to provide a right to counsel to fight back against that. It's also very exciting to see our state has finally passed a ban on uh, Section 8 discrimination, uh, so we're actually seeing some movement on preventing discrimination in, in housing. But uh, for, from the uh, LGBTQ renters in particular uh, that I talk with regularly, the threat of real estate speculation, of Ellis Act evictions, um, and of displacement remains the biggest threat. And I believe as the sole endorsed candidate Thank of the you. San Francisco Tenants Union that I'm in the best Thank position uh, to, to prevent that displacement. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Brown? Well, I'm the sole endorsed <laughs> candidate of Alice B. Toklas. So, <laughs> boy, there you go, huh? <laughs> Um, you know, housing is always really important. And when I was a, a neighborhood activist and then a legislative aide, I fought with my neighbors to actually bring LGBT housing into District 5. Um, and at the time it was District 5, it was 55 Laguna. And we actually worked to do that. Then we also worked to pass neighborhood preference so people in the neighborhood from our LGBT community could have affordable housing. This is so important, and especially for seniors LGBT. Um, so we have to continue this kind of model. We also have to make sure that we have funding for um, uh, AIDS. I mean, a lot of times people say, haven't we cured that? No, there are still issues that we have to be able to, be able to uh, fund. And a lot of it is health care. A lot of it is health care because of the drugs that they have been using for years and years. A lot of them are having side effects and they need uh, our funding and protection. Thank you very much. Mr. Lamb? One group I've been working with uh, over the last three or four months is the Log Cabin Republicans. They are a LGBT group. We meet in the Castro every month, um, and they're voting on my endorsement this, this month. Um, I am for the equal rights of all under the law, and here's where my right to counsel for all comes in. It's a defensive right to counsel for all, and Right now, Proposition F is for people who are facing evictions, but when you're discriminated and you are being oppressed or uh, some sort of offensive action or legal action is taken upon you, you can have the right to counsel for all so you get a free attorney to help you get the housing that you need. Thank you very much. Ms. O'Meara? Uh, I think uh, everyone here on this panel has uh, touched on uh, the issues and concerns of the LGBT community, um, TQ community. Um, I, uh, I share their, uh, their sentiments, and uh, I think that there has to be perhaps even a special council created specifically for LGBTQ communities um, who experience discrimination when it comes to housing, whether it's senior or youth. Um, and um, it's, it's something that must be 
addressed. It's, it's also our Im uh, moral imperative to be sensitive to those that are different than us. We're going to talk about identity politics. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, in San Francisco, one of the driving forces for our uh, economy are the small businesses we have here. Um, so starting with Ms. Brown, how do you think we can speed up the permitting processes for small businesses? Well, I actually legislated to do just that. I mean, it was about a year, year and a half to be for a lot of businesses to even open. So uh, I just uh, did pretty much a big major streamlining business, uh, streamlining for all businesses throughout the city, not only District 5, to help them uh, get open faster, to help give them more choices if they wanted to have two um, businesses in one space they can. I cleaned up a lot of codes to make it easier for businesses. I mean, you know, we have to look at all kinds of ways to help small businesses because the corridors, our corridors, are really the vital heartbeat of our neighborhoods. And if we don't have a corridor, a, a coffee shop, or somewhere uh, we can go to meet friends, this is gonna really change our, um, our neighborhoods. And so we really have to look at all kinds of ways to support small business. Um, we have the legacy business that we support, businesses that are over 20 years old. We help the, if you're, you, you're nominated, which I do nominate, we help them uh, with all, uh, the city helps them in all kinds of ways. But we also have to stop buying from Amazon, all of us. So, you know, brick and mortar. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Mr. Lamb. So I was, a, I was a businessman. I started my business in affiliate marketing here in San Francisco, but I'm doing this now, and I continue to work with small and local businesses. In fact, I work with over 50 plus um, to help find solutions to their issues that they're facing here in District 5. Um, one thing that was really hard that I have to say is the in increase in minimum wage is very, very, very tough for small businesses. If it increases to, over, to $20 or something like that, a small coffee shop can't can't sell that many coffees to to pay to coffee coffee workers, um, and taxes. So taxes inadvertently harm small businesses. Uh, one time I bought a water a, a couple of water bottles. I was taxed three different times for that for that lunch, um, like CPV. San Francisco Health Initiative. Uh, I could just go on and on with the taxes, but um, those are the two, two issues that small and local businesses are really struggle, struggling with today, and I hope to solve them. Ms. O'Meara? Uh, could you just reiterate the question again? Please? Sure. How can we speed up the permitting process for small businesses? The permitting? Permitting. Oh. Price. <clears throat> well, make it okay. accelerated. <laughs> Uh, uh, <clears throat> by that I mean, um, well, first of all, when we talk about small business, we need to be sensitive. It's very easy to look at the status quo and think it's normal for things to be as they are. But as we know, as a woman, as a black woman, uh, as um, if, uh, if uh, I don't, but here's the thing, we don't have I equitable representation of a diverse business ownership in this city that needs to be redressed. I think when I was going around District 5 in the Western edition and parts of uh, the Fillmore, one of the things that the, uh, my constituents said to me, do you know what, I feel like, I, he said, I would like to have a business as a black man and I feel like there isn't an opportunity or it isn't coming fast enough. There's also a dearth of businesses that are owned by women. They simply aren't as plentiful, or, or that's being really nice about it. There aren't yeah. enough women that own businesses, and I'd like to see a change Thank in you. that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Preston? Thanks. Um, so 
I, you know, I am a former small business owner myself. I was co-owner of uh, the historic mu music venue on Market Street, Cafe du Nord, uh, for years. So I'm very familiar with the difficulties and struggles of, of small businesses on permitting, uh, zoning, and other issues. But I do need to observe both in the question and some of the, the responses from the supervisor uh, that there's a tendency to, to focus on the thing in a way that's often the easiest to deal with. Uh, you know, the commercial landlords love the streamlining and rezoning proposals. What they don't love is a vacancy tax, a storefront vacancy tax. If you keep your, your storefront vacant for nine months or more, that the city will tax you. That's what the merchants I hear are, are talking about, the vacancies on their block, and that's what communities are hearing, uh, are, are demanding. But you got to stand up to the real estate industry uh, to get that. Other things we can do, a public bank, uh, where there's momentum for a public bank, which could do loans to small businesses, which would be very meaningful. And also, we should do a mentorship and training program similar to what the Small Business Administration does with the SCORE program that Thank pairs up you. experienced uh, entrepreneurs and small business owners Thank with you. folks who are struggling for training and consulting and, and technical assistance. Thank you very Thanks. much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this will be our last question. Excuse, excuse me, ma'am. Uh, one last thing I wanted no. to add in terms of small business when well, it comes to... Thank you, but okay. we've That's got okay. a timing Sorry. issue. Right. But I appreciate it. That's okay. um, our last question, and I'm going to combine two. two How minutes? do you... Uh, yes, <laughs> and Mr. Lamb's going to start. Sure. Uh, no, you get one minute because they pretty much go together. <laughs> Okay, how will you be held accountable? To what standard do you want to be held accountable as a candidate about your um, campaign promises? And how do you plan to ensure that the residents and folks of Dif District 5 have as much say as powerful donors and corporations on what goes on in, in District 5 and in the city? And we're going to start with Mr. Lamb. Okay, so uh, first question. Um, I, I take responsibility and integrity very seriously. In my term, I do promise a decrease in homelessness, and I'm going to make sure that happens. But um, I, the part in responsibility is you have to know your policies and know the effects it has on the economy and take responsibility for that. You can promise free everything, and people will vote for you, and then the economy collapses, and somebody, you could just be gone in, to another city in minutes. So um, for me, I have a research team who does very, very hard work, and they make sure that my policies are, are reliable, they're reachable, and they're attainable. So that's how I'm going to make sure my promises will be kept. Thank you very much. And, um, if you wish, because I believe you have about 10 seconds, do you sure. want to speak to how you will ensure that the folks in District 5 have as much sway with you as any donor you may oh, have? Sure. Yeah, one of my things is I really want a, a completely transparent campaign. On my website, I have all the contact information that you need. You can reach me directly and to my team. Um, and you can come to speak with me right after this if, if, you're, if you're willing to. Thank you, Mr. Lamb. Ms. O'Meara? Um, <clears throat> well, firstly, I think on the question of uh, integrity that Ryan just raised is um, crucial to having a fair campaign. I don't necessarily believe that the process is always fair or as transparent uh, as it's uh, led to be, at least in my experience. Um, and my disenchantment with either the Department of Elections or the Ethics Commission. That being said, I, um, I have concerns about, um, it's not up to me how somebody gets their money, but uh, Gordon Marr wrote an interesting article, one of the supervisors, Sunlight on Dark Money. And to me, there seems to be a correspondence between the people you get money from and what contracts they get and what you will vote for. Okay, so anything, for, I'll give you one example. Our mayor did not vote for Prop C. Well, that's a bit of a problem. Um, I, it's questionable, is what I'm saying. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Preston? 
Well, I think it starts with what kind of money you're taking uh, in the campaign. So we made a pledge early on in our campaign to run a clean money campaign. We're not taking money uh, from big real estate. We're not taking money from law enforcement interests, uh, fossil fuel industry, uh, charter school movement that's trying to divert funds from public schools uh, to charter schools increasingly. Uh, so we're not taking any of that money in the campaign. And it's a real problem how much money, the dark money that Namvula refers to, uh, pours into these races. There's already an independent expenditure uh, pack that was set up uh, to, to go after me and our campaign, um, and it's no mystery that that's gonna be real estate interests, and that's gonna be uh, Mr. Ron Conway and others. And what happens is they put all that money in, and under current law, nobody knows about it until months after the election. That's what happened in District 4 uh, to Gordon Marr, District 6 to Matt Haney. The good news is, just like our campaign, those folks ran Thank a door-to-door -door campaign and that all the Thank money you. against them did Thank not win the day. We Thank hope the same thing happens in District Thank 5. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Brown? <clears throat> yes, well, I have to say, 80% of my donations are from San Francisco, unlike uh, Dean Preston, and the majority of them are from District 5. So I am running and I have a community campaign and a donors. So I am not going to, people that live in District 5, I'm not gonna pit one person against another because of what you do. I feel like I need to bring people together. I don't divide people. And so that's my philosophy and I've always been that way. I came as a neighborhood activist. I worked with the community as a neighborhood of activists and I will do so always. I will never mislead you like some people saying that, oh, when I get into office, I'll do this. I'm not gonna do that because you hold me accountable. I'm the supervisor now and I am going to say what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do. And if I can't do it, I will tell you why and we will look for a way around it to make it work. But this has always been my policy um, I've all, because I come from the community. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, now we, come, now we come to the candidates' closing statements. But let me first remind you that if you aren't registered to vote, please do so right away and urge others you know to register. If you've changed your name or you changed your address, be sure to re-register to vote, okay? We will do the closing statements in reverse alphabetical order. And remember that you candidates, you have one minute for your closing statements. And we're gonna start with Mr. Preston. Thanks, well I wish I had time to rebut all the false statements that were made about our campaign donations, but I won't. Um, so thank you for being here uh, this evening. And let's remember uh, what this uh, is all about. It's about real people and their struggles uh, that folks face today in San Francisco. Seniors who are facing eviction, students, burdened by massive educational debt, transit riders that can't even get on their bus because it's too crowded, and families unable to afford affordable housing to stay in San Francisco. So I am running for supervisor so that City Hall starts working for the people who are struggling, not just the big corporations and corporate landlords. And that's the real difference in this race, and it's what's earned me the sole endorsement from so many trusted grassroots organizations like the Sierra Club, the United Education of San Francisco, the Affordable Housing Alliance, San Francisco Young Democrats, Latino Democratic Club, San Francisco Tenants Union, a majority of the current Board of Supervisors and former elected officials like Mark Leno, Jane Kim, Tom Amiano, Thank and Art Agnos. I look forward uh, to you. working with you all to take the big Thank steps you. we need to take here in San Thank Francisco. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ms. O'Mara. Could you hold your applause? I'm a, you'll get an opportunity. <laughs> Ms. O'Meara. Um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, for initiating this whole uh, meeting today. It's an honor to stand here amongst you and uh, to hear what uh, a lot of us have to say. I think a lot of us have more in common than what divides us. And I'll say, I'll, I'll tell you why. I got a very interesting quote from uh, former President Barack Obama. He said, the greatest sum of us 
unites us far, far, far better than the, the lesser of us that's polarized. Well, something to that effect. I think you understand what I'm saying is that when we polarize and we're divisive, there's fewer of that. But when we are bigger and united, we have the ability to make a lot of amends and changes. So my priority, um, if and when I get the job, is uh, I really think the housing issue is critical, not just because I have children. I can actually identify with millennials and what they're going through, as well Thank as you. the LGBTQ community, Thank because you. there is discrimination. Uh, in terms of housing. I think it's critical in our city and the rental Thank situation. You. Thank you very much. Mr. Lamb. So again, Ryan Lamb, um, I hope my points resonated with you. I wanna bring back uh, responsibility and integrity to City Hall um, with <clears throat> reliable and actually attainable policies. Um, if you're not satisfied with your life and City Hall right now, I'm the only candidate that's significantly different from the candidates up here in terms of policy and physically. So um, I hope you, I hope you, um, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. <clears throat> Ms. Brown? Yes, uh, you know, as supervisor, I bring a perspective and life experience that's really unique. I became an orphan at 14. I've been without health care. I've been evicted. And I've had to live in a van as a child because my mother could not put money together to, for the next apartment. So when I work on homelessness and housing, it's personal to me. I've achieved real results and the issues that, on the issues that matter. I'm just not talking about the Green New Deal. I've worked to create our clean energy provider and one of the first nation's plastic bag bans. I'm just not talking about housing. I work to turn creative affordable housing on city-owned and private land into 100% affordable housing. No one else on this panel has done that. And as, I, and as an activist, you learn not to take no for an answer, but you also learn to work with everyone to get the job done. And I'm fighting for what I believe in by listening and bringing people together rather than dividing. I truly appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. On, on behalf, on, on behalf of myself, the League of Women Voters of San Francisco, and our partner organization, our thanks to the candidates for for participating. And if you all have been to these forums before, you know this is a hard job. We're not easy here in San Francisco. <laughs> and thanks to each of you for taking the time to inform yourself about your choices on November 5th. Vote like your life depended on it. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let's give them a big round of applause. <laughs>